Another crisis as the Russia-Ukraine conflict heads into its eighth month. Hello, I'm Arnold Nider, and this is The Heat. The European Union is investigating ruptures in the Nord Stream pipelines which have sent tons of natural gas into the Baltic Sea. Authorities detected underwater explosions earlier this week. Meanwhile, residents in Russian-occupied eastern and southern Ukraine voted overwhelmingly in referendums to join the Russian Federation. CGTN's Sergio Olmos reports from Kyiv. The votes of Russia's orchestrated uh, referendum in these occupied territories in uh, Zaporizhia, Kherson, Donetsk, and Luhansk, uh, what Ukraine is calling a shout referendum, not just Ukraine, but the West, uh, uh, United States, Great Britain, France, uh, um, Germany, and also uh, countries that we think of as allies of Russia, such as Serbia, have called out, and, and even mediators like Turkey have said they will not accept the results of this. Uh, Moscow orchestrated election process in these four territories. Not surprisingly, they have all voted to join Russia by an overwhelming margin, uh, according to Russian state media. Uh, the numbers are staggering. 99% uh, of people, according to Russian state media in Luhansk, voted to join uh, Russia. 98% in, uh, in, uh, in Luhansk, 93% uh, in Zaporizhia, and 87% in Kherson. Uh, as a comparison, Vladimir Putin only got 77% of the vote in his re-election campaign in 2018. These numbers, of course, are one of the reasons that Ukraine says it does not uh, acknowledge these as a real elections, saying these are sham referendums, a pretext to just annexation. Uh, we heard from Ukraine's foreign minister saying forcing people in these territories to fill out some papers at the barrel of a, barrel of a gun is just another Russian crime in the course of its aggression against Ukraine. He also said Ukraine and the international community condemns such actions of, of Russia and it and considers them null and worthless. We know that Ukraine is continuing its uh, battlefield progress, trying to push out the Russian forces from uh, now, not just Kharkiv now, but pushing into Donbass surrounding the town of Leman. It also is continuing its counteroffensive in the south, though that is progressing at a slower pace. This comes as the United States has announced a new aid package, totaling their total totaling their aid now to just over $17 billion. The key part of that is the United States announced that Ukraine will get 18 new HIMARS. This more than doubles uh, Ukraine's current capacity. They had 16 HIMARS prior to this. Those HIMARS mobile rocket artillery systems allows them to strike at targets 50 miles in range. It's been credited with what uh, has allowed Ukraine to be so successful in its counteroffensives. It hasn't just slowed the Russian advance, it's really pushed it back. Uh, United States announcing 18 more uh, to help Ukraine as it progresses in its counteroffensive, trying to get back as much, as much territory as it can before the winter sets in and the muddy conditions make it difficult to cross over land. There is lots to discuss. Let's bring in our guests. Joining us from London, Marcus Papadopoulos is a historian, analyst and author specializing in Russia and the former Soviet Union. From Kyiv, we have Peter Zalmayev. He is the director of the Eurasia Democracy Initiative. From Brussels, Peter Klepe is editor-in-chief of the Brussels Report. And from Moscow, we have Viktor Olevich. He is the lead expert at the Center for Actual Politics, a Moscow-based think tank. Welcome to all of you. Peter Klepe in Brussels, let me start with you. And let's start with what has happened to the Nord Stream pipelines. Uh, it's ruptured. It's pouring millions of cubic feet of gas into the ocean, into the atmosphere as well. The uh, European countries say that indications are that this was deliberate. Somebody deliberately blew up the pipeline. The United uh, States Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, he said the gas leaks would not, quote, have a significant impact on Europe's energy resilience. Do you agree with that? Well, um, there's many unknowns and uh, pretty much the only thing we know for sure is that this is not some kind of um, earthquake induced uh, damage. That is, uh, it's, it's the result of an attack. And many experts uh, should think it's Russia, but there's like not a lot of uh, evidence. Uh, and it's probably too early to say much uh, sensible about that. Uh, in terms of will this actually hurt uh, Europe's energy supply? Well, yes. Um, you know, this is uh, even more Russian gas that is not being delivered. 
Uh, on top of that, Russia has also um, uh, almost completely ended uh, all the rest of its uh, gas deliveries uh, through Ukraine, uh, mostly. So I think it's only um, Hungary and maybe Greece to a degree that still receives some Russian uh, gas. Uh, so, um, can Europe survive without the Russian gas? Yes, of course, but at a high price, at a high price for its uh, manufacturing industry. Uh, you know, everything can be overcome, of course, uh, but then now European countries will need to uh, take um, very important decisions, for example, to invest back into European fossil fuels, mm -hmm. uh, something that they have been uh, building uh, down and uh, phasing out and as a result Europe has had to import lots of fossil fuels from places like Russia but also uh, Qatar, uh, Algeria and other places. Viktor Olovich, there we heard Peter Klepper in Brussels tell us that there are experts in Europe who believe that this is an attack and that Russia was responsible for this attack. What is your response to that? Well, it is pretty obvious that it was a deliberate act of sabotage. The question is, who is behind uh, these acts of sabotage? If we look at the interested parties, we will see that uh, Russia is probably the last party to be interested in something like that, because Russia invested, first of all, Russia invested considerable resources into building these pipelines. Russia was actually interested in pumping gas to Europe. Europe was uh, one of Russia's prime uh, customers as far as uh, gas supplies are concerned. And uh, at this point, uh, when these uh, gas pipelines were not in use, uh, why would Russia be interested in blowing up the infrastructure? There is nothing for Russia to gain from this, from this type of sabotage. So what is most likely to happen? You see, it's in this uh, in the tense international atmosphere, it's quite difficult to imagine that an objective investigation could be conducted internationally, the results of which would be recognized by all parties concerned. So what's most likely to happen is that Western states will uh, accuse Russia of sabotage and Russia will accuse uh, Western states of sabotage. Mm -hmm. We have already seen that the former foreign minister of Poland, mm -hmm. Radoslav Sikorski, has thanked the United States for this act of sabotage. Right. Of course, this does not prove anything, mm -hmm. but it does mean that there are European politicians yeah. uh, that are no friends of Russia, that believe that this is in the interest of some Western states. All right, let me go to London to Marcus Papadopoulos. Uh, Marcus, if this pipeline was deliberately attacked, and we are still waiting for an investigation to be completed on that, we may see evidence of that later, but if it was deliberately attacked, then that would be terrorism. That would be an attack on civilian infrastructure. Um, as Victor just pointed out to us a moment ago, the former Polish uh, foreign minister has thanked the United States. We've also heard President Biden uh, and a senior foreign affairs official, Victoria Newland, of the State Department here in Washington, threatened that pipeline in the past. So what do you make of what's happened? It is abundantly clear that Nord Stream was subjected to an act of sabotage. And I expect the United Nations Security Council to convene immediately to discuss what is an exceedingly dangerous and worrying development. Following on from that, I expect a United Nations investigation team to travel to the area to ascertain what caused the explosion. Now, the argument put out by Western mainstream media that Russia was responsible for the act of sabotage is not just untenable and tenuous, but it is also absolutely laughable. Russia spent a considerable amount of money in, um, in making Nord Stream, and Europe was providing a considerable source of money to the Kremlin via Nord Stream, even after the Russian army entered Ukraine and on the back of Western, European, uh, Western sanctions on the Russian economy. So I pose two questions. Firstly, who has warned 
that they would take action against Nord Stream? And secondly, who would benefit from taking action against Nord Stream? Let me answer the first question. At the start of the year, President Biden said explicitly that if the Russian army was to enter Ukraine, then America would disrupt, would end Nord Stream. Secondly, the Americans are doing their utmost to end Germany's uh, dependence on Russia for natural gas. And as a result of the act of sabotage against Nord Stream, it now looks highly likely that Germany will not be able to import Russian natural gas. Yeah. And therefore, Germany will be solely dependent on America for natural gas. Those are my submissions, and I believe my submissions are irrefutable. OK. Peter Zalmayev in uh, Kyiv, the Polish Prime Minister, and I'm quoting him here, he says, we do not know the details of what happened, but we can clearly see it was an act of sabotage. Um, and as we've just heard, this is going to hurt Germany particularly hard, coming at a time when there are many in Germany who are questioning Germany's support for the war going forward. Uh, we've also seen major protests in Prague today. Uh, tens of thousands of people took to the streets, protest protesting the high cost of energy. And I'm wondering, how concerned is Ukraine that something like this could lead to a fracture in the Western alliance against Russia, that they could be, this could have the effect of weakening support? Well, uh, there's no denial that there have always been you know, uh, those who sympathize with uh, with uh, with Russia, with Vladimir Putin, you know, we you have uh, uh, a significant, uh, you know, um, mm, presence of those in Hungary. The Prime Minister of Hungary is uh, Vladimir, Mr. Orban is Vladimir Putin's a friend, you know. So you will you would always have uh, you know you would always expect these uh, fractures, and that's obviously part of Vladimir Putin's strategy, as he sees no clear path to a military victory in Ukraine has already been demonstrated. Russia has lost its military initiative in Ukraine to the point where the, when Vladimir Putin went to Samarkand, uh, to the Shanghai Security Organization Summit, his uh, ostensible allies, China and India, did not have many words of encouragement to Vladimir Putin. So this just shows you that Vladimir Putin is desperate. He is trying to ratchet up, you know, the pressure on uh, on Europe. Uh, and and uh, yes, it's going to be tough. But so far, the Western alliance has held against Vladimir Putin's attempts at blackmail. Uh, and despite these, uh, you know, what you mentioned, these events, uh, you know, uh, demonstration in Czech Republic, etc. Czech Republic does not matter that much, okay? Let's face this. Uh, what matters is that Germany is on board, France is on board, Great Britain and the U.S. And already, not only uh, is the, you know, um, th does the help uh, uh, continue, but America is stepping up its military assistance to the tune of another billion dollar package. It's sending 18 more HIMARS rocket launch right. uh, systems uh, and uh, and both the EU and the US are considering another package of sanctions. Peter Klappe, the European Union has announced uh, what's been described as biting new sanctions against Russia, and they will include tighter trade restrictions, more individual blacklistings, and an oil price cap for oil from third countries as well. Um, point is, can Europe go ahead with implementing these kinds of sanctions in any effective way, given that there are many, many countries in Europe and countries around the world that are facing serious economic pressures right now? We have inflation going up all around the world, and there is a fear that we will soon be entering a global recession. Well, Europe uh, can. In theory, the question is, will uh, EU member states uh, block this, uh, these proposals? Uh, first of all, it's not entirely clear what the European Commission, uh, you know, wants to cover. Um, and secondly, as you say, you know, the energy crisis is, is biting uh, quite hard all across um, the continent. Uh, also in Italy, we have a new government. I think they will not be uh, pro-Russian, uh, but they are definitely, you know, firmly in the Franco-German camp which means uh, that they're not against Ukraine. They want to help Ukraine, but they also want to think if 
what is being decided is actually helping Ukraine. And, uh, you know, if you look at what's been decided, the, the sort of the military support, that's undeniable. That has been great help um, for Ukraine to be able to defend itself. At the same time, Western nations have made sure that, you know, they did not get entangled in the war themselves. And so far, so good. And let's hope it stays that way. If you look at the sanctions, I mean, I think even proponents of the sanctions will need to admit that uh, they have not actually made a great difference, um, apart from hurting, you know, uh, European uh, economies. Right. Um, and they also provoked uh, Putin into cutting off the gas, which is a very, I think, um, which is going to be a painful decision for Russia mm -hmm. uh, in the next few decades, I think. Um, their reputation as a reliable gas supplier has been damaged. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, the sanctions, I think, uh, it's, it's a good, there's a good chance that these will be questioned, at least to a degree. Viktor Olovich, let's move on to those referendums that were conducted in Donetsk, Kherson, Luhansk, and Zaporizhia. Uh, as we heard earlier on, huge numbers of people uh, in those areas who have voted overwhelmingly uh, to become part of Russia, to become part of a Russian union, to join the Federation of Russia. Now, the next step would be formal annexation. And if that happens, what does that mean? I mean, could this seriously widen the scope of this conflict that we're seeing right now? Well, the reason for this is geopolitical. Uh, Russia is currently trying to draw uh, red lines uh, beyond which it is not going to, um, to step away. So essentially, those four regions that have uh, uh, participated in the referendums, that held those referendums, and that are going to join, uh, officially join Russia within the next several weeks, uh, basically, Moscow is uh, saying to the West that it is not going to withdraw beyond this line. Mm -hmm. And if the Ukrainian army continues to shell and attack these regions that are under Russian control, and it is likely that the Ukrainian army will continue to do that, then Russia will resort to uh, other types of uh, military responses, uh, harsher military responses than it has uh, uh, than it has uh, resorted to so far. If one has to remember that uh, right now Russia is going through a mobilization campaign. It is going to have uh, a lot more manpower on the front. But even if that does not work at, uh, at some point, if the Russian political military leadership decides that that does not work, then one has to remember that Russia is a nuclear power. There is no way that Ukraine can win this conflict. Let's be realistic. No matter how much support Ukraine gets from the West, no matter how much support Europe or the United States provides to Ukraine, military support, economic support, or any other type of support, Russia has the ultimate advantage in this conflict. And it's important to understand that Russia is considering the implications of that, too. Right. Victor, you so say... We have one, to look one at moment, the, Victor. What are, what are, yeah, one moment. I mean, you say um, there is no ways that Ukraine can win in this conflict, but Russia has just suffered some serious setbacks, hasn't it? Russia, if it chooses to use tactical nuclear weapons on the territory of Ukraine, it will be it, it will demobil essentially uh, make the Ukrainian army ineffective mm -hmm. within hours if it chooses to do that. Russia is, is a power that is not willing to lose, and it has the resources and the instruments to win in a, a, on any day that it wants to. The consequences for Russia would be uh, very difficult, extremely yeah. difficult. It would face isolation not only from the West, but, but from other countries such as India, Serbia, and other countries that have either been allies with Russia or right. had uh, partnerships with, with Moscow. And Russia understands that, but Russia is not going, is not willing to lose this fight. Right. This is extremely important to Moscow, and is not going to step beyond the red, uh, for, step uh, down from the red lines that it set. All right. Let me. Uh, so essentially, if yeah. that happens, and that that and that would be a catastrophic scenario. Yeah. The, uh, you know, there, there would be no winners in this yeah. except the United States. Okay. Let me go to Marcus uh, in London and get his opinion on this. Marcus, uh, you know, as we're hearing this. 
conflict could take a very serious turn for the worse. Uh, Victor telling us that there could be a possibility of the use of tactical nuclear weapons in this conflict. Where do you see it going? I mean, what do you see happening? Uh, especially now um, that we've seen these territories vote for joining the, um, the Russian Union, I mean, reducing the size of Ukraine considerably. I do not believe that Russia will use nuclear weapons in the Ukrainian conflict. The Russian army from since the 24th of February has held the initiative in Ukraine. There was no Ukrainian counteroffensive in Kherson. What we saw in Kherson were, were Ukrainian soldiers and Ukrainian army hurled recklessly at Russian fortifications, which resulted in huge losses in Ukrainian manpower and armor. Now, in Kharkov, there was a successful Ukrainian counteroffensive, mm. but the Russian army carried out a tactical retreat. A tactical retreat is not the same as a retreat. And the reason why the Russians carried out a tactical retreat was because of a shortage of manpower. And as I said at the time, and I say now, that is a problem mm -hmm. that Russia can remedy very quickly and very effectively through partial mobilization. Now, turning to the referendums, anyone who is well versed in Russian history will tell you what I'm about to say now, namely that in Ukraine, there is a substantial percentage of the population who identify with Russia in cultural and spiritual terms. Conversely, in the westernmost part of Ukraine, principally Lvov, Ternopol and Ivano-Frankivsk, and to a lesser extent, Volin and Rivni, there the populations are largely hostile to Russia. But as a result of the river of deceit on a biblical scale emanating from the mouths of Western mainstream journalists, what I have said just now is deemed by them to be Russian propaganda, when it is nothing of the sort. The problem is that Western mainstream journalists are firstly not journalists, and they are not experts on Russia or Ukraine. If I was to ask a Western mainstream journalist right here, right now, to tell me the significance of 1654, yeah. the Treaty of Pereyaslav, and Bogdan Kelmitsky, they would not have the faintest idea as right. to what right. I am talking about. Okay, Peter Zalmayev, uh, I want to get to another development that we have seen uh, today, Wednesday. Military representatives from 40 countries met in Brussels, and they met to discuss ramping up production of weapons for Ukraine in anticipation of what they say will be a war that's going to last years. According to the New York Times, the meeting was held under the auspices of the Ukraine Defense Contact Group, which is a group which was not formed in Ukraine or by Ukraine, but was formed by the United States Defense Department here in Washington, D.C. Uh, it was created shortly after uh, February 24th. Um, is Ukraine okay with this? Is Ukraine going to go along with this? Are Ukrainians going to go along with this? The fact that, yeah, we have the members of 40 countries deciding that this war is going to last for years? Well, these are the countries that have decided that uh, Ukraine's victory is uh, not only possible, but it's a must if the world, you know, uh, is to defend its world order, which is basically that a country, just because it has nuclear weapons, cannot, uh, through its whim, through its will, just uh, unilaterally change another country's borders. That's the lesson that's been applied elsewhere. That's a lesson that was applied uh, when it came to Saddam Hussein's uh, um, invasion of Kuwait. And yes, I have questions about America's 
let's say, you know, adventures or mis misadventures in the world, uh, its uh, involvements in the Middle East, etc. But, um, you know, uh, America has never, in, you know, in recent memory, tried to annex another country. Neither has another, you know, any other European country tried to do that since World War II. So that's a major principle that's at stake. Mm -hmm. And contrary to what the previous speaker said uh, and, the, and the one before, uh, Ukraine has shown that it has the fighting spirit that's enough, that is sufficient to defeat the Russian army that is reportedly demoralized, increasingly demoralized, goes, folks, go on New York Times page and check out for yourself reports by Russian soldiers, uh, starting with the Battle of Kiev and what they say about their military, military leadership. What the previous speaker said uh, about a tactical retreat, come on, uh, leaving 300 uh, pieces of artillery, heavy artillery, tanks, hundreds of tanks behind. That's a tactical retreat. Yeah. Come on. And mobilization, if it's so easy to do and it's such a useful thing, why didn't Russia do it before? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you why. Because it does not have the wherewithal to equip okay. the army. And not many Russians want to go and die in Ukraine. Right. Peter Zelmayev, the reason I ask that question is because there is a widespread view, and I'm sure you are aware of this, that this is not a war between Ukraine and Russia. It's a war between NATO and Russia. It's a proxy war. You, most, you would have heard of that and that it's being fought on Ukrainian soil, and Ukrainians are paying for this. That's that's Kremlin's line. You just you just repeated what the Kremlin has said. You know why? Because the Kremlin it cannot acknowledge it's fighting with Ukraine, because it's it you know, it makes Putin look like a, a sour loser. Like what? Ukraine? We're losing to Ukraine? No, it's NATO they're fighting against. It's a pathetic attempt to cover up for Russia's essential inability to win wars, you know, okay. real wars, not wars like Syria or Chechnya, where it can just go in and yeah. terrorize civilian population. This is a real war. Okay. And Russia does not have the second world, uh, largest army in the world anymore. It's been exposed to okay. the entire world and All right. ridiculed. All right, Peter, I'm going to go very quickly to Marcus. Marcus, I've only got about 40 seconds. What is your view on what you've just heard? What I have just heard is both regrettable and lamentable. For someone to cite the New York Times as an independent and authoritative outlet is preposterous nonsense. American mainstream media, like British mainstream media, yeah. is neither free nor independent. Yeah. And in regard to accounts of Russian soldiers, well, the New York Times, like The Guardian or The Telegraph in yeah. Britain, never actually identifies who the sources are right, who right. spoke to these Russian soldiers. OK, OK, Marcus, I have to go. Uh, well, thanks to all of you for being with us. We need to leave it there. We have run out of time. I'm Arnold Naidu in Washington, D.C. Thanks for watching.